Um, we're going to try to wrap things up here, and uh, we're really happy to have with us Otis Brawley, um, an old friend of NCI. There are questions about whether he ever left NCI, but the truth is he has left NCI. He's the Chief Medical Officer and Executive Vice President of the American Cancer Society. He's, as, uh, as such, he's responsible for promoting the goals of cancer prevention, early detection, and quality treatment through cancer research and education. He's a professor of hematology and oncology uh, and medicine and epidemiology at Emory University. From uh, April 2001 to November 2007, he was a medical director of the Georgia Cancer Center for Excellence at Grady Memorial Hospital in Atlanta. He's led in a long and distinguished career. We've seen Otis in the media. He has a way of saying things that, that excite. We'll just leave it at that. And, and we are glad to have him here, and we're hoping that he will excite. So welcome, Otis, and uh, we really appreciate your participation. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a, almost sort of like an, uh, an NCI reunion when you come into a room and there's Rachel Ballard Barbash and Helen Meisner and Bob Hyatt. And uh, we were all there when Ernie Hawk was uh, the young kid down the hallway. And it was actually a fun time. And it's, it's neat to see how we've all turned out. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here in uh, Las Vegas, I think, after having walked through uh, that area and got exposed to all those carcinogens at, uh, among the gamblers. Uh, I got here late last night and I decided to walk down the strip a little bit and I saw four Elvis Presleys walking toward me. And the first thing I did was, you know, am I drunk? Because I hadn't been drinking. And then, then I realized I was the only person who thought that was unusual. But in any event, uh, I had a wonderful time sitting through some talks today and hearing some things. I want to just sort of reflect on those things. Uh, what we need is not perhaps reformation of health care, but transformation of health care. Some of the things that I heard today made me think, uh, gee, interestingly, never heard anybody talk about the internet as a source of information. Maybe it was mentioned and I missed it, but I just didn't hear anybody talking about that. Uh, we heard a lot of talk about the electronic medical record, and it seems that much is vested in it as the salvation of health care, increasing efficiency, and so forth. Perhaps too much is vested in it, and we really need to think about how we're going to direct that. Good talk about effectiveness versus efficacy. Uh, unfortunately, many doctors don't know the difference between the two. Um, I didn't hear these words, but it was in the room talking about rational use of health care as opposed to what the politicians scare us about with the rationing of health care. Uh, one of the problems with American health care is it just sort of happened. It didn't get designed. And you know that old uh, saying that a camel is a horse designed by a committee? American health care didn't even have a committee. And so it just sort of happened, and we've got a lot of issues going on. Within cancer, we have a number of vested interest groups. Uh, by the way, what I'm going to talk about is the American Cancer Society as a player amongst those vested interest view groups, an overview of the entire situation, including looking at the health economy, America's poor health IQ, and really the urgency of the situation that we're talking about, and the need to focus on uh, prevention. Instead of health care reform, we need health care transformation uh, from treatment and consumption of health care uh, to one that actually values prevention. Uh, the ACS has several leadership roles. We think of ourselves as a source of information at multiple levels, information primarily to the patient and to policymakers, but also to uh, healthcare providers, be they nurses or physicians. 
uh, through our internet uh, website as well as through our journals. We're a sponsor of research in universities for the most part. Uh, it would be wonderful if we sponsored research in social, uh, in more social settings as opposed to more academic settings. We are very interested in quality of life of the cancer patient and the cancer patient's caregiver and supporting uh, the cancer patient and the caregiver. And we're very interested in prevention and early detection, perhaps uh, we're most famous for our screening guidelines. We are dedicated to helping people get well, stay well, finding cures, and fighting back. Fighting back is a euphemism for we do a lot of stuff in Washington. We have 70 people in our uh, advocacy, do not call them lobbyists, office. Uh, those 70 people uh, do things such as uh, Supporting healthcare reform or healthcare transformation, supporting smoking controls, uh, including taxation of uh, tobacco. Uh, they do a great deal in terms of supporting uh, NIH and the National Cancer Institute's budget. Uh, Ernie uh, Kaluzny uh, was up here earlier today, and he's an old, old friend, um, indeed, uh, uh, a wise fellow. Uh, one of the things that we used to talk about a lot is how you need to tell people what's known, what's not known, and what's believed. Uh, and uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. I believe that one of the great threats to America's future is apathy, ignorance, and greed. Uh, apathy, ignorance, and greed on the part of uh, multiple levels, patients, uh, doctors, and others. And, and when we reform in reforming how health care is paid for is actually going to be incredibly important because right now we're based on consumption of services as opposed to quality outputs. We need to transform how we view medicine and the we is at multiple levels. It's the patients, it's the doctors, it's the hospitals, it's the health insurers, it's the policy makers. And if we can truly transform health care, we're going to be able to decrease costs, which is going to be very important as I talk about costs, decrease disparities, which is something that is very dear to me, and we can improve quality. Uh, this is going to require some broad critical thinking and an understanding of the scientific method. One of the things that perhaps I didn't hear as much about today, maybe it was talked about yesterday, yesterday is people, be they patients, uh, family members, uh, doctors, nurses, uh, frequently don't understand the scientific method. Indeed, that's why alternative medicine is so popular in the United States. Uh, we need to use evidence-based care and prevention. If we understood the scientific method, I think that would be easier. And again, we need to start rationally using medicine and stop scaring people with talks about rationing of medicine, uh, although I think we should all realize that rationing of medicine already occurs. Uh, our goal should be good outcomes and saving lives, and I want to point out that we can do better, and we should. Um, saving lives is an interesting point. I had a great conversation with Bob Croyle not too long ago. Um, my boss, uh, John Seffrin, the C uh, CEO of the American Cancer Society, is very fond of saying we're about saving lives. Uh, I keep telling him that what we really do is avert mortality. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> and then Bob Crowell reminded me that what we really do is we delay mortality. But anyway, uh, all of those things are good outcomes, be it saving lives, averting deaths, or uh, averting mortality or delaying mortality. The issues are that there are huge irrational patterns of consumption of health care in the United States, and this is due to a lack of education and a lack of understanding of science on the part of both physicians and patients. There is a huge lack of basic prevention. All of you who walked over here from the hotel saw the obesity, lack of exercise, high caloric intake, and especially the smoking that is increasing health care costs. In addition, there's an aging of the American population, uh, partially due to the fact that uh, our we have actually had some successes, but our colleagues in uh, cardiology and infectious disease have had even more. And uh, as a result, uh, there are 30 million people over 65 in the year 2000, and there's going to be 71 million over 65 in the year 2030. Keep in mind, the average age of a person diagnosed with cancer in the United States is 71.
So there's an increasing number of candidates to get cancer. Uh, and this was, I just threw this in because somebody had asked me about it earlier at lunch. This slide goes from 1975 through the year 2020. The blue solid line is the actual number of deaths of Americans from cancer by year. Uh, that is, uh, I don't have a pointer here. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, that is uh, the actual number. The dotted blue line is our projection of how many people uh, will be dying in the future after 2010 uh, if we continue at our current rate of health promotion. The red line represents, uh, with the aging of the population, growing of the population, the red line represents how many people would have died if we had not started many of the cancer control uh, things that we started in the 1960s. And the red line versus the blue line actually does indicate that such things as smoking cessation is the big driver here, but also things like colon cancer, cancer screening, breast cancer screening, um, sun avoidance, and some of our treatment improvements actually have uh, averted mortality. Uh, and this is evidence that we are doing something good. The green dotted line at, starts around 2013 actually shows uh, what our epidemiologists think we could do in terms of number of deaths in a given year if we simply started employing all the things that we know work. Uh, and that, in that, all the things that we know work actually has smoking going from a 20% prevalence uh, in the United States down to the 10 or 11% prevalence in California. If we could drive smoking to zero, this, no, this green line would be even steeper downward. Uh, things that we know about obesity, about uh, exercise, uh, about, uh, and especially since we're talking about just in the next 10 years, about getting the screening and treatment that we actually know is beneficial to people who currently don't get it. And that brings up the concept of health disparity, something very dear to my heart. And that's the concept that some patients, however defined, don't do as well as others. And you can define them in a number of different ways. Um, how can we provide adequate, high quality care to include preventative care to people who so frequently don't get it is, I think, one of the most important questions that we can ask ourselves. This is a slide I always try to throw into uh, talks because I think it's one of the most important slides. Uh, that we who claim to be proud of America should be aware of. Uh, this is a Kaplan-Meier curve. Stage one is uh, red. This is colon cancer. Stage two is blue. Stage three is green. Stage four is yellow. The solid lines are insured and the dotted lines are uninsured. And this is just to show, if you look over on the far right here, that uh, stage two, I want to press the right button here. I better not try it. I might screw something up. It doesn't work. Stage two insured has a better five-year survival than stage one uninsured. Okay, you are better off having the more advanced colon cancer in the United States with insurance than having the least advanced colon cancer without insurance. And at every stage, the uninsured do not do as well as the insured at every stage. This is uh, part of the problem with American health care today. Uh, indeed, some people consume too much health care, meaning unnecessary care is given. Some consume too little. And we could actually decrease the waste and improve overall health if we simply adapted evidence-based medicine and tried to get that evidence-based medicine to everyone. Uh, in talking about the situation that you're going to, that you are doing research in, we all need to realize that American health care in 2009 cost $2.53 trillion. That seems like a small number when you say $2.53 trillion, but how big is a trillion? A million seconds ago was Friday of last week, eight days ago. A billion seconds ago was about the time Richard Nixon resigned in 1974. A trillion seconds ago 
was 30,000 years before Christ. A trillion is a big number, and we spent $2.53 trillion in healthcare. Let's put it into another perspective. We spent $1.1 trillion in 2009 on food and $2.53 trillion on healthcare. And personal consumption in all of China was only $1.4 trillion. Healthcare was 17.3% of our gross domestic product. 17.3 cents out of every dollar spent in the United States in 2009 was healthcare. At the current rate of growth, by 2025, a quarter of every dollar spent on health care, a quarter of every dollar spent in the United States will be spent on health care. And that, my friends, is about the point where we will have health care reform. And our choice is, are we going to have health care reform sooner, and are we going to take over and actually model it, or are we going to let economic forces just allow health care reform uh, to essentially uh, what happened in designing the current system? There was no plan. There was nobody actually trying to mold something, and we got something that's far worse than a camel. This is priced of health care per person on a per capita basis. And you can see as a country gets wealthier, health care costs more. And indeed, this line is incredibly linear. Iceland and Switzerland are countries that are better off than Poland and Portugal, and so their health care on a per person basis is more expensive. There's the United States. We are off the line. Okay? We are off the line. Now, we don't really get what we pay for. Uh, we are 49th in life expectancy. Uh, we're in good company. Albania is 50th. Uh, some people say that we ought to look at people who reach the age of 65, and that's what I've shown you here. Among people who get to the age of 65, we are 12th overall for males and we are 16th overall for females. And you'll note Canada is actually far farther to the left. They're about the seventh country from the left there. Uh, and and uh, a number of countries do far better than we do. Zeroing in on Canada and Switzerland. Infant mortality, we don't get what we pay for with our expensive health care system. White male life expectancy, we don't get what we pay for. And what we pay is their per capita cost. By the way, we're one and a half times more expensive per person than Switzerland, which is the number two country in per capita cost. Number two, by the way, in gross domestic product is Israel, and they're slightly less than 12%. We're at 17% and growing. That's on a mega level. On the employer level, that's one level that we haven't talked about much, in, at least today. And being an administrator at the American Cancer Society, I have to deal with this all, all the time. And I will tell you that these national averages are actually very close to the American Cancer Society's costs for our 6,200 employees. In the year 2000, health insurance costs $2,471 on average for an individual policy as bought by an employer and $6,438 for a family policy as bought by an employer. By the year 2009, you can see that those prices have gone up dramatically. They've more than doubled. Indeed, at the American Cancer Society, we have uh, clerks and administrative assistants who uh, get paid $24,000 a year, but when we hire them, we have to think that the family insurance plan for them is going to cost us $14,000 a year. So one of the things that actually keeps us from hiring people, especially people who get paid less than $50,000 a year, is literally the fact it's going to cost us $14,000 more in health insurance. And we haven't started talking about the other insurances. Uh, this is actually a threat to the economy. 
Now, consumption of health care and overutilization is also a multi-level problem. And uh, one of the problems is we are very individualistic in the United States. We're very into me versus us. Uh, and individualism, thank you, uh, individualism is a real problem. Patients who believe in cost containment for health care until you're talking about them as the patient. Doctors who are paid to treat, we're not paid to prevent. And by the way, I'm a treater. Hospitals and clinics that are paid to treat. Insurance is a huge, big business. By the way, uh, most uh, insurance companies have 20% uh, overhead cost, and most insurance companies have been making money hand over fist, healthcare insurance companies for the last decade. Uh, we have huge medical gluttony, uh, screening tests of no proven value, uh, treatments of no proven value, laboratory and radiologic imaging done for convenience because we can't find the original film, done for legal defense, be it real or imagine, or sometimes we do x-rays purely out of tradition. Uh, Canada versus the United States. Uh, I showed you that Canada has better outcomes than the United States, yet for CT scanners, we have three times more CT scanners on a population basis than Canada, five times more MRI scanners. Uh, it might very well be said that we don't make people live longer in the United States, but we sure as hell do a better job taking pictures of them dying. Reforming how healthcare is paid for and transforming how we view and consume it is incredibly important. Our healthcare system is heavily fo focused on addressing illness, and the system needs to transform into one that values prevention. Obesity, high caloric intake, and lack of physical activity is uh, increasing rates of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, orthopedic injury, and uh, cancer. Uh, I specifically should warn you that I talk about obesity. I do not talk about the condition known as overweight because of a conflict of interest. <laughs> Trends in obesity prevalence are a huge problem. Now, I have a lot of data to show that getting fat causes cancer. I have very little data to show that losing weight prevents cancer. It might prevent cancer. I just don't have the data to show it. And for that reason, uh, I'd I think one of the groups that we need to focus on is pediatrics. And please note that for kids age 6 to 11, 4% of them were obese in the year 1970, years 71 to 74, and 20% are obese in the last survey, 2007 to 2008. This is in Haynes' data. Uh, for teenagers, it's gone from 6% to 18%. A tripling for teenagers and actually a quadrupling, more than a quadrupling uh, for uh, uh, kids age 6 to 11. This is something that we desperately need to focus on. We need to turn toward prevention. Uh, we need to figure out how we can provide adequate high quality care to include preventive services to populations that so often have not received it. Indeed, uh, the white middle class is a disparate population when it comes to prevention because they have not been getting that care. And so in summary, how do we increase the health IQ of Americans? How do we increase America's interest in health? And how do we create a healthy skepticism of American medicine realizing that we have, we treaters have a significant conflict of interest. Uh, because right now we make money, actually I was kind of joking with somebody about it, uh, but it's actually true. All those smokers out there, for me that's revenue. That, that's my future income, because I treat cancer. So I'm going to stop at that point, and maybe there will be some people who have some other, com uh, other comments that they want to make, or God help me if they have questions. Thank you. So we do have a chance. There is a chance for questions. There are questions. He doesn't want questions, but we, we invited him. We helped him get here. So we, we're, going to ask, we're going to ask him a few questions. Anybody have any questions for uh, Dr. Browley? 
Oh, Lord, sting. Uh, Fortis, I think your talk is pretty radical. I wonder if you would uh, consider radicalizing it even a bit more. Um, your talk, and a lot of what we've heard about at the conference, uh, basically says that U.S. healthcare sucks. And I wonder if you would consider actually talking about the effects of the huge sucking sound of U.S. healthcare. And you can see it in the decisions that governors are having to make uh, in the states around the country. We're sucking so many resources into healthcare that we're taking resources away from the social determinants of health that probably have a bigger effect and certainly are important for the inequalities that, that we see. So you can say all those things. You can say even while we're providing more access, even while we're trying to reduce costs, even while we're uh, trying to improve quality, at the same time, we actually need to spend less on that so we can do other things that are about health, not about selling the commodity of healthcare. I mean, you're, you're on the edge, but I just. <laughs> Well, you know, the the issue is what you're talking about really does get into rationing, and I think that would be a turnoff to a lot of people. Uh, you know, you can get way way out there, and with with what you what you're saying there, and maybe I can keep saying what I'm saying, and maybe we can push people in the direction that we want to go, realizing that neither of us are going to get you know what I'm saying. Right now, I don't. I honestly don't believe is where we're going to. Be. We're not going to be able to get that far. But I think we can get a little bit more prevention. I just worry that the economy won't. The economy is going to collapse. I really am very concerned about that. Comment over here. Teresa Gillespie from Emory University. Thank you so much. Um, you alluded to how can we increase the health IQ of the country, but you didn't really give us any specific um, ways to do that. And you make a comment that while obesity, uh, we know that being fat may increase the risk of cancer, but we don't know if losing weight does. However, we do know that losing weight is very good for other parts. That's true. And so maybe the people in the lobby have read that drinking alcohol may decrease their risk of heart disease. And so there's a lot of mixed messages that American people get, and they're not really sure how to discern what is most pertinent to them, what should they be doing. And I think OECS is, is part of those messages. And, and can you maybe just comment on that? Yeah. Our, our statements, by the way, on the web, and I usually, when I, when I have a longer time to talk about it, we encourage weight loss because it definitely does decrease cardiac disease, diabetes, it even decreases uh, orthopedic injury, which is a significant cost in the United States. So it's a good thing for adults to lose weight. And it may actually even prevent cancer. We just don't have that evidence. Um, the, uh, I am very concerned. I think when I look at health messaging, and I don't know, this is perhaps Barbara Reimer's influence on my thinking, and, and to a certain extent Dick Wernicke, who's in the audience, so I gotta be very careful. I think of health messaging the same way I think of my uh, T1 line on my computer. If we send out a lot of messages, some of those messages are not going to be received or going to be received in a distorted fashion. If we send out a few key important messages, we're actually more likely to do more good in terms of affecting change among people's health care, uh, among people's health behavior. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why, for example, when um, Congresswoman Deborah Wasserman Schultz decided to uh, come up with a bill to take money and teach kids in high school how to do breast self-exam and to scare them about breast cancer, I was worried because what we need to be talking about with high school girls is diet, obesity, caloric intake, and not scaring them about breast cancer. Uh, actually, we went very public about that, and that was in the newspapers a lot, so that's why I bring that one up. But I think you're absolutely right that there are too many convoluted messages. Some of those messages, by the way, here I'm going to get controversial, are by people who have a moneyed interest. That's a huge problem. Uh, especially uh, screening uh, advertisements from hospitals. Uh, 
I come from, well, you're, you're in Atlanta, you know, uh, the RC Cancer, I name names, that's another thing. The RC Cancer Center, which is a huge radiotherapy practice in Atlanta, was recently giving tickets to Atlanta Hawks basketball games to men who showed up at the Kroger parking lot and went into the van and get screened for prostate cancer. There's no informed decision making there. It's just we're giving these guys these tickets so that they can get screened so that we can make money. And it implies to these guys that prostate cancer screening is more effective than we know it to be. Uh, there's all kinds of issues with diet and, uh, um, and uh, the alcohol one is a great one. You know, the, uh, the, the wine industry it finds every study that suggests that wine is good for you. They don't find any studies and publicized studies that suggest wine is bad for you. You're right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Brolin, for a great, uh, inspiring, uh, provocative talk. I'm Russ Glasgow from the uh, NCI, I'm the new deputy director for uh, Dr. Bob Croyle for <laughs> Implementation Science. Um, again, follow up on this general topic that, uh, that Kurt started off and, and on the issue that you raised about messaging, which I think is really critical. I think we didn't hear much about it today. Uh, it was the topic, as I'm sure you know, uh, I forget if you were there or your uh, colleagues, uh, about a week and a half ago in Atlanta on the meeting on health communication I, science. I was there for just the first morning. Yeah, well, I'm struck by how similar the issues are at the two meetings, but how we're not making a connection between the two. Uh, in particular, I think you just pointed, maybe that will make her happy, we'll see. One made the connection with advertising and the money to be made there. Um, and um, I, uh, I think that we need to have a greater attention to the issues of health communication messaging and framing at multiple levels at the current uh, of the issues up here. And I think one thing that would be interesting for all of us in this room predominantly our, our researchers or federal employees, is to think about how we connect with all the various players, all the way up from uh, patients and families to healthcare providers to health decision makers and things. Uh, around issues, there's a phenomenal little paperback book called The Political Mind by George Lakoff. And it talks about, it's essentially about reaching the population and how generally those of us interested in pushing this type of healthcare reform, interested in prevention, we naively think that we're going to win the day with our data, with our rational arguments, with our logical things like what we're talking about debate to last, when in fact, usually, who frames the debate related to an emotional push-button issue is the one that wins the who frames the debate, because it's death panels, it's not emotional mm -hmm. care at the end of life. So I just wondered if you had any uh, thoughts about that and how that might interact with kind of issues of science, policy, and this multi-level meeting. You are you are so right that the people who frame the issue, death panels is a great example, can frequently overwhelm data. I, you know, my first experience with this was uh, when I was at the NCI and Sam Broder was our director and we had the, uh, uh, the fraud in uh, Montreal and the Congressman Dingell called us all down and uh, Broder, Sam was wonderful in explaining that yes, there had been this one trial, but thank God there were seven other trials that had verified this finding. And he said this very nicely in an open hearing, it was on C-SPAN. And then there's this lady, breast cancer survivor, who got a lumpectomy and radiation, who followed Sam and she's crying about, did she get the right treatment? And, and she won. <laughs> Sam not only had data, he had data from seven other trials, but she won. Uh, and, and, and very frequently uh, on, Ca on Capitol Hill, by the way, I have had the uh, opportunity once to try to explain to one congresswoman the difference between incidence and mortality. So their health IQ is frequently not very good. Uh, but the one individual and the anecdote can be incredibly powerful and overwhelm data. I mean, it's part of the anti-science. I think uh, coming down the elevator earlier today, uh, Ernie Kaluzny was saying that he was concerned about 
everybody starting to not appreciate science and gov in government very much in government a lot of places there's uh, actually not just a lack of appreciation for science but a disdain for it and that's part of what you're talking about Ernie I hope I didn't misrepresent you And I had a question um, with the recent policy developments of the medical home and accountable care organizations, how you think those developments relate to the quality of cancer care across the continuum? I, I'm still struck by the comment this morning about accountable care organizations being HMO and drag. I, I, I really like that. Uh, <laughs> uh, we desperately need to try other ways of paying for health care and reimbursing for health care. We desperately need to do that. Many of you may be familiar with the uh, uh, story about McAllen, Texas, that was in the New York New Yorker, Atul Gawanda's article. Uh, I've actually been down to McAllen, Texas, and let me tell you how that happened. There's a wonderful man, a Mexican immigrant named Cantu. Mr. Cantu became a billionaire building things. And he wanted to do something for McAllen, so he built a hospital for McAllen and a doctor's office building next to the hospital. And then he went around the country and he'd find good doctors and say, if you move to McAllen, I will give you a stake in the hospital, doctor's hospital, and I'll give you a sweetheart rate for renting office space and my company will build you a new house. Okay, uh, you have to pay for it, but you know. But in any event, he attracted all these doctors to McAllen, Texas, and he put them all into a doctor's office building next to the hospital that the doctors had part equity in. The end result was the general internist would see a patient with diabetes, and instead of prescribing the metformin, he would send the patient over to the endocrinologist, who would then start seeing him and prescribing the metformin. If he had a patient who had complicated high blood pressure, he'd send him over to the cardiologist. In, in the in the world of securities and stocks, this is called churning, okay? And that's why per person healthcare in McAllen, Texas, it was the highest anywhere in the United States for Medicare. Medicare was paying $18,000 a person for care in McAllen, Texas in 2009, where the Medicare average is somewhere on the order of 8,000 around the country. Now, if you can get some type of way of controlling that kind of situation. And I don't know what the answer is. The answer is to do some experiments and find out what the answer is. And uh, 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 these various things that you these various other ways of paying are all things that we need to look into. Thank you very, oh, one last comment, thanks. I wanted to follow up on that last comment that you made. Um, certainly we heard a lot in during the healthcare reform debates about we have to figure out what to do. There are 23 developed nations who deliver healthcare for half or less than we do and have better outcomes. I don't understand why we have to spend so much time figuring out what to do when there are so many examples in the world of people doing so much better. Why don't we just do what they do? Because I'll tell you the exact reason. Uh, a single payer system is politically unpalatable. You know, uh, you're right. As a matter of fact, Switzerland, which is the system that I think is probably the best, has several different insurance companies. Uh, but. Uh, yeah, we, by the way, tort reform was never tackled in healthcare reform because people were afraid of it. There's some things that are politically not palatable that uh, uh, people are just afraid to deal with. The problem is political and social. It isn't figuring out a better system. He, which, what he said was the problem is political and social and not figuring out a better system. I, I agree with the problems political and social, but I actually do believe that the system in the United States needs to change. It may need to change closer toward a system in uh, Europe. Well, as promised, uh, Dr. Brawley was exciting. Okay. And, and we got one more, well, I, we're, 
One practical, one practical question from Dr. Charnes, and then we'll wrap it up because we. Me up there to answer questions all day, so I'll you get to ask, ask one. one. All right, so, go for it. Uh, in, uh, in taking your last comment about things that haven't been politically acceptable, why we don't have reform, um, and the issue about data. Uh, on the way out here, I had a five and a half hour airplane ride. This is a story. Um, and sitting next to me was a nice fellow. Um, and as we were talking, I had a middle seat on top of it. Um, as we were talking, uh, you know, I said, well, I do healthcare research. And um, he said, well, well, tell me all about um, healthcare reform. So he started asking questions and so on. And I was pointing out the facts. I had, you know, I had lots of facts because I interact with people like you. And, um, you know, I was telling him about the poor statistics in terms of the quality of care in the United States and our health status and so on. And I was pointing out how other countries, you know, for example, in the UK, um, Canada, England, Australia have better health care systems. And he said to me, oh, I hate it. I, I, I'm Irish. I hated the healthcare system over there. And I didn't have a way, no matter how many mm -hmm. statistics I cited, I didn't, by the end of that terribly long plane flight, <laughs> um, I didn't have a way of convincing him that in fact we're, the healthcare reform is moving the right direction, although it falls way short yeah. of what we're going to do. But he, like many people that I hear, uh, you know, resist the changes that we're trying to make. Uh, so how do we convince people that, you know, if the numbers don't work, what do we do? Yeah. And uh, I, I have another flight going back. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, what you bring up, remember that Tom Cruise movie where he plays a lawyer and there's this crusty Marine colonel who's a famous actor, I can't remember who, it, Jack Nicholson, and Tom Cruise screams, I want the truth. And the crusty colonel says, you can't handle the truth. That's how I, I feel like that colonel sometimes. The American people cannot handle the truth, and until people started realizing that the entire, the, the, the entire economy is going to collapse unless we start doing something rational about this. Until they realize that, nothing is going to be uh, done that's going to be productive. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bradley. You did not disappoint.